I'm sorry, that is so distracting. This thing. All righties. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome to my channel. There's a couple of things going on right now. First of all, I'm in my lounge room because this is the only place that has aircon and it is like a trillion bajillion point one degrees and so that's why we're here um and then second thing is that of course i live in australia this place is full of flies all of the windows and doors are closed so i don't know what they want but apparently they've moved in so i've got like a spray thing like the automatic spray thing that i've moved into the lounge room because i don't want are you joking did you just see that Welcome to another True Crime Sunday. Before we get started, this is actually a really well-known case. And it was actually in the later parts of my research that, because when I cover a case, usually I cover a case because I want to, um, and it's because I'm like intrigued by it, or something that I, I have a very strong opinion on that I think that I know what had happened. So at the end of my research, usually I will go onto YouTube and see what other true crime YouTubers have said in their theories. This is when I had found out at the end of all of this research that Bella Fiore, I think that's how you say her name, just posted a video on this case. Literally, I don't know, maybe like within a week ago. And so I was like, dang it. You know what I watched her video and the, these two videos are gonna be completely different because she has parts in her video that actually came up different in my research of this case although she did do a very um, good job on her video and obviously um, you don't need me to tell you that because I'm just a small little account but if you've been with me for however long I've been on here a couple of months you will know that I do a lot of research into cases and I tend to come up to my own opinions on things that might not be the same as other true crime YouTubers. And it's kind of hard to um, have a different kind of opinion on this one, even though there are some like discrepancies in the research that I've personally found compared to other true crime YouTubers. But this case is one of the most covered cases in the true crime community. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video because I think that I've found enough evidence to debunk most of the theories and yeah. So today's case we are covering the Brennan Swanson missing persons case. So Brennan was born on January 30th, 1989 in Marshall, which is in Minnesota, which is in the USA. So he was slash is a Caucasian male. He was 19 at the time. He had like curly, dark brown hair. He wore glasses. He was legally blind in his left eye. And at the time that he vanished, he was studying um, wind turbines at Minnesota West community and technical college. So to celebrate the end of his studying semester, he wanted to celebrate and there were a couple of parties that he wanted to go to. On the night of May 14th in 2008, he had two parties to attend and the night is kind of, it's not very well reported and there are a couple of reasons why you can take this with a grain of salt in terms of how much Brennan was drinking that night. So on the first party, a lot of people said, oh, you know, like he wasn't really that drunk. We don't really know how many drinks he had had, but he didn't come off noticeably drunk. So he left that first party at around 10.30 to 11-ish. Not a lot of people were paying too much attention to the time. And so that's just a guesstimate, but he did leave that party and drive to another friend's house which was in Canby, and that was to say farewell to a fellow classmate and a friend. Again, at this second party, people, and understandably, people were not paying attention to how much he was drinking, so people can't really confirm whether or not he was super intoxicated or not intoxicated or whatever, but he was confirmed to have had one shot of Jack Daniels, and I'm assuming that people can confirm that because it might have been like a group shot, you know, when you're like, yay, end of semester, everyone do a shot, and so they can confirm that he had at least one shot of Jack Daniels. He was said to have left the second party at around midnight. And 
again with these recordings you take them with a grain of salt because first of all these are kids Second of all, it's a celebration. Third of all, there may have been substances, at least, at the very least, alcohol, and no one's paying attention to the time. So that is just a guesstimate. Now, something that I would like to interject with that not a lot of people have mentioned in their videos, um, Brandon had actually had a previous DUI. He had been caught drink driving in the past, and I don't exactly remember what the punishment was. I just remember that it went for about a year, and he had just come off that um, punishment or whatever of drink driving. So on this night, he was drink driving again. And I do think that that is an incredibly important thing to um, tell you guys, especially in the videos that haven't said that he had a DUI. I think it's relevant because of the thing that makes this case so bewildering um, is his choices that he made that night. In terms of his route, in terms of where he believed he was, that is the thing that makes everybody regarding this case think, what the heck? And so that is why I think it's really important to note that, first of all, he had had a previous DUI. Second of all, he was drink driving again. He had left the second party, which was in Canby, and he was supposed to be heading to Marshall. Now, the highway from Canby to Marshall is pretty much just one road, one highway, Highway 68. Uh, and he was very, very, very familiar with this highway. He had taken it plenty of times before, and he was described as being someone who knew these roads, somebody who knew the area um, enough to know where he was and which town he was in. So Highway 68 is, um, if you take that route, it's just over half an hour to get from Canby to Marshall. Um, but another thing is that even though there is a straight shot from Canby to Marshall, we have to remember that he's drink driving and he had just come off a whole year of some sort of punishment for having a previous DUI. So he doesn't want to get caught again. And what happens when you're driving on a busy highway, um, you know, on a night that, you know, police know that kids are going to be out there celebrating. It's the end of semester, perfect time to catch kids drink driving. And he is no stranger to that. And so he decided, and we are just assuming that this is the reason he took the back streets, but it is a pretty good assumption, I'm going to say, is this is the reason he took the back streets instead of taking the straight shot straight to Marshall. But because Highway 68 runs on like a diagonal angle to the streets, the, the back streets are kind of like a, a grid. Um, and usually if I'm taking the back streets, which I don't because I don't drink drive, but um, I mean, in Australia, you're allowed to have one standard drink, um, but generally I don't drink drive. But if I was to take the back streets in Australia, in my head, you kind of just follow the general direction of the main road. Um, you know, by maneuvering through the back streets, but you can't really do that with the back streets following the direction of Highway 68 because Highway 68 cuts across the streets diagonally, which means that they have to, like, you kind of have to zigzag to follow that direction, to end up going the same direction that Highway 68 goes on if you're taking the back streets. So another thing to note is that these back streets aren't always paved with cement. Um, a lot of them are gravel roads and really poorly lit. So even though, you know, even if you take away the fact that he might be drunk or on something else, driving, just being sober on back streets that first of all zigzag, you know, like you have to go left, then you kind of have to go wait, oh my god, you have to go left, then you kind of have to go right, and then go left, and then right, and then left, kind of in a general direction. It's really easy to get turned around, especially if they are poorly lit and you, you inebriated and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's what he does to avoid a breathalyzer test, because he is drink driving again, and um, 
you don't want to get caught because these roads maybe were a little bit less familiar to him than highway 68 and you know they're on they're poorly lit they're zigzaggy and they're gravel and not great roads he actually got hung up on one of the roads he got his car stuck a lot of people say that he had crashed he didn't crash he actually just got hung up, which means that two of his wheels weren't connected with the ground because the road was on a extremely sharp incline. So when two tires aren't touching the road, you can't get enough traction to go any more forward. And so he got stuck. He wasn't, he didn't crash. There was no damage to the car. There was no damage to him. Dust got hung up um, as the sheriff described it. Um, and the sheriff did say he didn't crash, he just got like hung up to where his two tires were just off the road. So we know that he had left the last party just after midnight. And then from phone records, we know that when he had got hung up, he was trying to call his friends, likely the same friends from the party because they would have been the closest people to come and help him, come and collect him. And it was, you know, there was a period of about half an hour where he was trying to call all of his friends, trying to get somebody to come and help him out. But none of his friends answered his calls. So about half an hour of trying to get some of his friends to come and help him and, and to no avail, he decided that the only thing left to do now was to call his parents. So he did. He called his parents just shy of 2am. And it's likely that he had tried to call his friends first, not just because they were the closest people to come and get him, but probably because his parents already knew about his previous DUI and he didn't want them to know that he had been drink driving again. And then secondly, like you don't want your parents to know that you've got hung up on a ditch because you, you're you not going to hear the end of it. I mean, I wouldn't know. I don't have parents, but I, I watch TV. I know how... I know how parents are. I know why you don't want to tell your parents. So his parents' names are Brian and Annette Swanson. And so they received a call from their son being like, I need help. Can you come and get me? This was, again, just shy of 2 a.m. And here's the thing. Brendan described to his parents exactly where he believed that he was. And his parents have confirmed that, yeah, he was extremely confident in where he thought he was. He genuinely um, believed that where he described was exactly where he was. Like he was confident and there was no doubt about where he was. So he had said to his parents, I am on the left side of the road in between the Savannah Hills Golf Course and the, oh, and Lind. Um, and that was just off Highway 23. And so he was adamant that that is where he was. Now, I know that it being almost 2020, logically, that 2008 wasn't like five years ago. But in my head, it still seems like that's recent times, right? That's like iPhone times. But wrong. That's actually not iPhone times. 2008 is a point in time where we still had the phones where you had to click the number two like three times to get the letter C. People assume that I am in my like early 20s. Girl, I am not. I am closer to 30 than I am to 20. So I was around at that time. I have my own Nokia phone. Um, but it is important to note that 2008 is not a smartphone time. You can't just send your location. Um, at that point in time, he didn't even have GPS in his car, as in like a nav man or like anything else to ping him, to tell him where he is. So keep in mind, he doesn't have GPS and his phone is resilient, first of all, not a smartphone, second of all, and doesn't have the capability of giving anyone their location and also doesn't have find my iPhone. He told his parents, don't worry, I'm not injured, the car isn't damaged, um, I didn't crash, I, the wheels are just off the ground and I can't get my car to go anywhere. Um, can you please just come and get me? And so his parents were like, okay, we're gonna come and get you right now. When his parents came to the place where he had said that he was, they were like, okay, we're here, where are you? And he was like, do you not see me? Like to come down a little bit further. They were like, we cannot see, we don't know where you are. So Annette actually came up with a really good idea to say, hey, well, okay, well, we're gonna flash our headlights on and off and then you just come towards the headlights. And so she was like, can you see us? And he was like, no, I'm like, I can't see you. And she was like, okay, well you do it. 
and then will come to you. And so he was turning on and off his headlights and Annette confirmed that she heard the clicking of him turning on and off his headlights through the phone because I don't know about your model of cars, but you'd definitely be able to hear me clicking on and off my headlights uh, on my car. You know, the little... She can confirm that she heard the clicking through the phone, so he definitely was doing it, but she couldn't see him doing anything. Like, she couldn't see any headlights, no flashing. Understandably, the both of them got extremely frustrated to the point where Brandon actually hung up on his mother. And then Annette growing a little bit worried, called him back and she was like, I'm sorry for getting frustrated. And he was like, don't you see me? And they were like, no. And then so he was like, okay, well, here's what I'm gonna do. I can kind of see the glowing lights in front of me from Lind. I'm just gonna go walk there. Can you guys meet me in the Lind uh, local tavern in the car park there and we'll just fix it from there. Brian and Annette, decided that they would drive home, drop a net home, and then go and meet Brendan in the car park while he was walking because it was gonna be a little bit of a walk. For Brendan to get from his car to where he believed that Lind was, uh, it was gonna take a little bit of time and so his dad said that oh, I wanna stay on the phone with you uh, while you're walking because it's late at night, it's dark, um, we don't know if and I'm gonna talk about whether or not his dad believed that he was um, intoxicated later and a, a little bit more about that later, but you know, it's dark. His dad doesn't want him to be walking alone. Um, and so they stay on the phone with each other while he's walking. Now, during this final call, Brandon's dad is obviously still driving. He dropped Annette home and he was driving toward the tavern. And Brandon says that he's he's decided that he wants to cut across fields rather than walking on the roads. He said, I'm just going to cut across these fields. It's going to take way less time than if I'm on the actual roads. Um, and it'll be like a little shortcut. And so he's cutting across all of these fields. And during this call, he mentions that he sees two sets of fences and that he can hear running water. He says that he can see the lights of Lind in front of him. And even on the phone, Brendan's dad, Brian, says that like he heard that there was running water in the background. Then all of a sudden, Brendan says, oh shit. And then the line goes completely silent on his dad's end. His dad cannot hear anything. It was... The line was still connected, but there was no sound coming from his son's end. Brian attempted to call his son several times after to no avail. And then after their son didn't come home at around 6.30 a.m., Annette and Brian decided they wanted to file a missing persons report. But because Brandon was a 19-year-old boy, well, a 19 year old man, the police said that he has every right to go missing and that sometimes teenagers just want a break from their parents and that technically he is not a child anymore. So he has every right to go missing and they didn't take their missing persons report. But the police during this time, you know, obviously they've got some worried parents. Um, one police officer decided that they wanted to actually get the information from Brandon's cell phone records and during the last activity on Brandon's cell phone records it actually pinged in a random place. It was random because they said he was certain about where he was, about where he was describing for them to pick him up. He was not there. The phone records showed that his phone was actually pinging from Porter. Now, Porter actually sits between Canby and Marshall, and he believed that he was heading toward Lind. He believed he was closer to Lind than anything. Um, and so whatever town he was seeing in the distance was not Lind. And because his phone was pinging in Porter, when everyone assumed that he was heading toward Lind and he was missing, that is when police were kind of like, oh, okay, we maybe we, we should look into this. And it is a little bit different than 
just a teenage boy going missing because in this instance we have someone who's actually asked for help and then the circumstances to which they've disappeared have been prefaced by an oh shit and then the line going dead. This is not the same as someone choosing to go missing. This is not the same as someone choosing to just have a little bit of a breather from their parents. That was not the case. And so it was at about lunchtime the next day that they took action. This is the entire reason, not the entire reason, but the, the huge reason as to why the Brennan Swanson case is so strange because he believed and was confident in the fact that he believed he was in between the Savannah Hills Golf Course and Lind, when really he was pinging in Porter. So that is the entire reason that his parents couldn't see his flashing headlights and he couldn't see his parents flashing headlights. And another reason that everyone thinks that this case is so strange is because he was said to not have been that intoxicated purely from the reports of his friends and, and from his parents. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then secondly, because he was said to have known this area super well because he took Highway 68 every single day. And so... That is what makes everyone think, what the heck? And we're gonna talk about that later as well. Just kidding, we're gonna talk about that now because I realized that I wrote that in my notes. So we're gonna talk about that now. So we're gonna actually look at these few things before we head on to the rest of the case because I wanna look at these with a critical lens because Mm, other true crime YouTubers aren't being critical of this information and thinking about it logically. And so I want to look at a couple of these things that make this case so distinct from other cases. First of all, that his parents and his friends said that he wasn't that drunk. Second of all, that he was said to have taken that highway quite often and he knew enough about the area to distinguish Lind from Porter, from Marshall, um, from Canby. Like he could distinguish these different areas. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the friends saying that he wasn't that drunk. It was just alcohol at the party. Um, we have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, I don't want to say anyone's a liar and I don't want to say that anyone's like, how dare they lie? You know, this is a missing person's case. How dare they? These are just kids and these are just kids at a party and if something happened like this that was super serious and you don't want to get in trouble and there were illegal drugs at a party, first of all, I don't want to get in trouble, all right? So I'm just going to say there's alcohol, there was alcohol at the party, but he wasn't drinking that much. Second of all, I don't want to talk shit about my missing friend. I don't want to make my missing friend seem like he, you know, is... De a degenerate or anything like that like I don't want to I don't want to make my missing friend look like he was doing something wrong because I want people to focus on my missing friend and finding my missing friend and I don't want to tarnish my missing friend's reputation so yeah they don't want to get in trouble and it's a missing friend so whether or not Brandon did partake in any illegal drugs at any one of those parties there is a huge reason and like a huge motivation as to why children aren't going to say, oh, actually there was weed at the party or, oh, actually, you know, there were pills at the party or there was cocaine at the party. Um, these are not little boys. These are young people who are in college they have just come off semester i know even in high school there are people who are um you know experimenting with ecstasy and definitely weed like you would be silly to assume that these kids aren't having more than one beer having more than one shot of jack daniels and it doesn't even matter if um you know if brendan didn't take any drugs at the party if it was just alcohol because we know he was drinking doesn't matter these kids still have a motivation to say that it was just alcohol at the party to kind of shirk any sort of responsibility off them and not get in trouble so that is something to keep in mind secondly 
there were reports of a pipe being found in Brandon's car. Um, now, this, they haven't specified what kind of pipe this was, so it could literally be any kind of pipe. It could be a pipe for, because I know there are pipes for like marijuana, and um, obviously there are pipes for worse drugs, but it was never specified. We don't have any details on what kind of pipe that was. Um, and then secondly, something that I run into, like I ran into so many times, um, not so much on like true crime videos on YouTube about this case, but more so threads from people who grew up with him and from people who were in those towns. And so that's why um, I'm going to acknowledge this next thing, but I'm going to say take it with a grain of salt because people in small towns like to talk and you can't back any of that up. I don't have that as evidence. So just take it with a grain of salt. It was a huge rumor that Brandon owed people money for first of all drugs and then second of all for um, like trucks that he didn't pay for. Um, or at least that he still owed money on. So, I'm not going to give too much weight to that in terms of like a, a foul play thing. I know a lot of people like to say there was foul play and we'll talk about that later. But uh, that's just something to note about the whole drugs, alcohol, owing people money thing, the pipe that was found in his car. Just keep that in mind. Now. Let's talk about um, his parents saying that he wasn't drunk, or at least on the phone, because they didn't see him, they just spoke to him on the phone. Um, they have said that they're pretty confident that Brandon wasn't drunk that night. We do need to look at this critically, and I don't want to upset the parents, um, not that they would, would be watching this video, but I, also, I just want to be respectful as always. Um, but we do have to look at this critically, because he has had a previous DUI. DUI, DUI, oh my god. So he has had a problem with drink driving in the past. We know that he was drink driving that night, but they say that he wasn't super drunk. Now, there are um, like a whole plethora of reasons as to why a parent might say, no, my child wasn't drunk. And it's basically the same reasons as why his friend said that he wasn't drunk that night. That he was drinking, that he wasn't drunk, that there weren't any drugs. First of all, if I'm a parent and I know that my child has had a problem with drink driving and that he was drink driving that night, I don't want people to judge me as a parent and I also don't want to get in trouble as a parent and I also want people to focus on finding him rather than focusing on, you know, was he drunk that night? Was he drink driving again? And we know that these are small towns and we know that people talk and I would want people to be focusing on finding my child. So that is another reason as to why the parents might have said, no, he wasn't drink like he wasn't drinking that night, he wasn't drunk, even though we know that he had been drinking. Um, they do say that that they don't think he would be able to fake it that long because he was on the phone to them for about, uh, for, like we know that the last phone call was 47 minutes, but we know that he was on and off phone calls in between that time. That brings us into the next thing. So this next thing is something that I haven't seen anyone talk about and it was like the first thing that I thought about when I was looking at everybody's criticism of whether or not they thought that he could have been under the influence, um, how he got so turned around um, and how he was so confused and was he drunk. Okay, we know he left the party at around midnight. We know he was drinking and drink driving. Yes, it is possible for him to have gotten turned around. Um, it is possible that he was, he was very intoxicated when he got lost. But there was a period of about two hours before he actually spoke to his parents. Two hours is a long time and I'm assuming that there that he didn't have alcohol in the car with him and that gives him plenty of time to sober up enough to realize that either he's lost or to make out to his parents that he's not drunk. That is a lot of time to sober up. So I believe that yeah, he was drunk when he got lost and he genuinely believed that he was somewhere where he wasn't and that is why he was so confused. But two hours is a really long time to sober up and I haven't heard anyone talk about that yet, so something to note. Now my next piece of critical analysis on the facts 
um, and on like everyone's assumptions on this case is that how did he get so turned around if he knew these roads? We assume that he knows these roads because his parents said that he knew the area enough to distinguish Porter from Marshall, from Lind, you know, all these different areas he knew uh, well enough to distinguish them because first of all he was living in Marshall um, and he took Highway 68 all the time. We aren't talking about Highway 68, we're talking about the back streets. He may not have been familiar with the back streets. We've only had confirmation that he's familiar with Highway 68. So it is, first of all, he may have been drunk. Second of all, even if he wasn't drunk, the roads are unlit. He may not be familiar with the back streets. He may have been familiar with the areas that he knew within these places, like his friend's house, his other friend's house, his house in Marshall, um, his university in Marshall, and all of these places would be connected by Highway 68, of which we know he traveled quite often. But how often was he drink driving? How often was he trying to avoid Highway 68? We can't say that. We just know that on this particular night, he was trying to avoid Highway 68, and that's why he took the back roads. So we cannot say with certainty that he knew the back roads he was taking, and maybe that's why he got so turned around, but felt confident that he knew where he was, because I know you get a little bit confident when you're drunk and you're like, surely I wouldn't have got so turned around, surely not. And so that's probably why he believed that he was in a certain place when he wasn't because maybe he wasn't familiar with the back streets. Also, the back streets were zigzags. I'm gonna put a map in here. That's what it looks like. You have to go like, like left, right, like it's just like, you don't just follow the general direction of Highway 68 because it's on a, angle across the streets. I also want to add to the parents, um, you know, whether or not they knew or not that he was drink driving again or that if he was drunk or maybe they're just saying that he just, he was drunk but he wasn't intoxicated. I also want to say that like two hours, first of all, is a really long time to be able to sober up but if you are not wanting your parents to know that you're drunk, you're gonna do the best that you can to kind of like fib. And so maybe he was good enough at being on the phone with them and kind of being a little bit more sober to play off like he wasn't drunk. You know, um, I'm a really bad liar, but it sounded like he was confident enough to be getting frustrated with them, being pretty confident about where he was to, you know, make out like he wasn't drunk. Um, I have, someone who I'm seeing right now who fibs all the time um, and like plays pranks and stuff. And I'm like, how do you, how are you so good at tricking me? Because I believe you every time. Um, and he's, he's just confident. And so I'm assuming that, you know, Brendan maybe didn't want his parents to know that he, that maybe the reason that he got hung up on the road is because he was avoiding Highway 68 and that's why he was on the back streets and because he was drinking again. So maybe Brendan was just a really good, um, you know, maybe he was just really good at, I don't wanna say the word, but not, maybe Brendan just pulled off being sober really well. Brendan's sedan was actually found um, about a mile and a half from Taunton. And Taunton actually sits on the border of uh, Yellow Medicine County and Lincoln County. Here's another thing that not a lot of people have mentioned is that his car was found with the door still open. There was no physical damage to the car again, but the door was open. The only, like the only time that I have heard anyone mention that the door was open was when they pair it with a theory of foul play. I don't want to pair it with that theory because I don't think foul play is a plausible theory. I think the door was open. I, 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 th I think that the fact that the door was open speaks to Brendan being intoxicated. There's more of a chance of 
that happening than foul play because of the area that he was in. On top of the fact that he was talking to his father for 47 minutes after he left his car. So we know that Brendan was alive and well, not worried about anything. He didn't mention he was with anyone. So we know that the door was open, which means that he either left the door open or he left the, the whole entire car unlocked and someone maybe looted the car from the time that he had left the car to the time where they had found the car. I don't know how plausible, like, I mean, it's likely um, and it's possible that someone looted the car, but there didn't seem to be anything missing. But when they had found the car, the door was open. To me, it speaks to not foul play because we know that he was on the phone to his father about an hour after he had left the car. Um, and by that point, he was long gone. For me, it speaks to the fact that maybe he was both frustrated and drunk. And so he just got out of his car and was just like, heck this, I'm walking towards the lights. And he didn't close his car door. That's up to you guys to decide what you think happened. But for me, it seems like it speaks to how drunk he was. And also maybe how frustrated he was. Especially because it's a habit for me, well it's a habit for anybody to close their car door. And it's also a habit to press the button and lock the door. I I'm, I'm gonna say that that for me speaks to him being intoxicated. And I don't wanna rule out the possibility that someone may have looted his car, that maybe he just doesn't lock his car door. Maybe he, he because he grew up in a town that had like half the amount of crime that surrounding towns had. So maybe he was just used to not locking his car door and maybe it wasn't a habit for him. We can't rule that out. But again, you guys think what you wanna think. I don't wanna rule out the fact that maybe someone looted the car and maybe um, they just didn't find anything that they wanted and they left the car door open. Uh, but yeah, so when they found Brandon's car. They actually brought sniffer dogs to it. And the sniffer dogs led the searchers to an area that basically matched the description of what Brennan's father said that Brennan had saw that night. It was an area that was uh, in a field and there were two sets of fences and there was the Yellow Medicine River. This is a uh, pretty accurate to the description that Brennan had described to his father shortly before the oh shit and then the silent line moment happened. The dogs then followed the scent to the Yellow Medicine River and they got in the water. They followed Brendan's scent to go in the water suggesting that he had fallen in the Yellow Medicine River. I believe that this is when the oh shit moment happened, that he either dropped his phone in the water and he went in to go get it, or that he himself fell in to the Yellow Medicine River. But that is not where it ends because the dogs got out of the water and then continued his path, which means that he was able to climb out of the river and continue walking. I'm going to interject and mention that the night that he went missing, it was three degrees Celsius. I personally have never felt that temperature. Um, it is literally freezing at like 14 degrees. And I think the coldest I have ever felt is eight degrees or six degrees. And I, that's when you need heaters and like 10 jumpers. Like it's, that is when you're like shivering. And that's when you're dry, wearing clothes. Brendan wasn't dressed for the weather. Brendan also had obviously fallen into the river and so he was soaking wet. I don't ever want to feel what three degrees feels like, but those were the conditions that night. So the sniffer dogs followed the scent along the eastern side of the Yellow Medicine River and they went through a field and shortly before they hit this gravel road, they lost this scent and it is probably because coincidentally enough that gravel road had been like turned over that morning literally like so basically what they were doing is when they level out the road um and 
that can destroy a scent. And it happened that morning. So what we have to work on right now is actually a lot, but then it's also not a lot. Now, for particular reasons, some people believe that foul play was involved. There are a couple of different types of foul play. First one is because he did owe people some money for drugs and for trucks that he still owed money on. I don't believe that this has anything to do with his disappearance. Firstly, because if it was drug money, you know, you don't kill somebody who owes you money because then you're never gonna get your money. Uh, usually you hurt somebody who owes you money. Now, in this particular situation, how is this supposed drug lord or not even a drug lord, maybe just like some, some you know, guy who, you know, some guy that he owed money, how is he supposed to know exactly what random back road uh, Brandon had broken down on? Um, how is this drug person gonna, you know, coincidentally come up on him and then wait an hour later after watching Brandon fall into the river and like while talking to his dad? and then follow him through another field to then murder him and then leave no trace of any body, any clothing, his glasses, the hat that he was wearing, his cell phone. I don't think that a drug person is gonna kill Brandon, especially in these random circumstances. Like, if you're gonna kill someone, it's gonna be planned um, and there is not a very high chance of it being an opportunist killing of someone that he knew because it was such a random circumstance. So I'm ruling that one out just for me. I know there are people who are like adamant on believing that even in threads when it's been like discredited, people are still like, well, no, I believe that it was drugs because he owed people money. Um, but I don't think that that's the case. Second of all, a lot of people believe that he was gunned down by one of the farmers. Now this actually does have, this comes into my theory at the end, but I don't think that a farmer is gonna be awake at, what time would it have been? It would have been just before 3 a.m. I don't think a farmer's gonna be awake in his field at 3 a.m. You know what I'm saying? I don't think that they're gonna just gun down someone at 3 a.m. And I also think that someone will remember a gunshot. And I also think that um, there would be absolutely no way for a farmer to get rid of uh, parts of a body, parts of maybe brain, um, clothes, hair, any DNA evidence that a dog would have found literally because they started the search the next day. I don't think that shooting him or, you know, for trespassing, I don't think that's plausible because I think they would have found something because they searched so quickly after. Oh my God, fly! So I don't think that foul play in terms of a, being gunned down by a farmer for trespassing, I just don't think that that is part of this. The next thing is that people uh, tend to not like the idea that he dropped his phone in the Yellow Medicine River. Even though the dogs tracked out that that was his path, that he went into the river, he got out and then continued on, people do not want to believe that that was when the oh shit moment happened. Um, so usually when people say, no, that's not what happened, they like to say that, uh, that the oh shit moment happened either because he fell in a sinkhole or because he saw somebody and he yelled, oh shit, and dropped his phone. Here's the thing. He was on the phone to his dad at the time. I'm going to talk about sinkholes later. Um, but right now we're working on the theory that people believe that he had seen someone that, and that's why he, he said, oh shit, and dropped his phone. He was still on the other line. His dad was still on the other line. It went silent. It didn't end the call, it just went completely silent. There was no sound coming from Brendan's line through to Brian's line. If he had just simply dropped his phone on the floor, um, unless the battery came out, which I know that does happen with some phones, but if the battery came out, then the line would have gone dead. 
So if he dropped his phone because he saw someone and there was an altercation where he got hurt or there was foul play, his dad would have heard on the other line because he did stay on the line for quite some time after. So that's where I'm ruling that out. I know people are going to be adamant being like, no, he didn't fall in the water. No, the oh shit moment couldn't have been when he, when he fell in the water. Um, otherwise, his phone would have died. That's why I mentioned at the start of this video that his phone was not a smartphone. And also there was a phone company, well his phone company, who came out and explained why his phone didn't disconnect the line, um, but why it still rang out and why like it was silent. Because those old phones, when they go into the water, some of them will still like be able to get a signal out but the mechanics inside the phone, which like translate the sound from my end to your end, weren't working when it went into the phone. That is why the line still stayed connected, but the sound, like the electronic part, like the actual mechanics of the part that make the sound go from my end to your end, stopped working. And why did it continue to ring out? Because his father rang the phone for two days and it still made that noise on on the father's end um even two days after brendan went missing everyone's like well if it fell in the water then why was it still ringing out so the phone company have actually explained this they said that the on brian's line actually only is telling us that brian's phone is doing what he has told it that that you're hearing has nothing to do with the other person's phone. The other person's phone could be dead, the other person's phone could be, you know, doing whatever. The and the fact that it doesn't just go to st like straight to voicemail only says that your phone is trying to get a signal out to Brendan's phone. It is an indicator that your phone is doing what you've asked it to do. And also, if you've ever seen anybody's phone, especially the old phones, uh, fall into the water when they're like, you know, getting a call, you can still see it light up in the water. Doesn't mean that your phone's not broken, but some part of it is still working. Um, and so that is the, the biggest thing that people are like, well, no, he didn't fall into the water. But we know that he did because the dogs mapped out his path saying he went into the water and he came out. So next we're going to talk about sinkholes. And this is actually something that Bella mentioned in her video. And she said that sinkholes are common in Minnesota, which isn't actually true. This comes up quite a lot in the research for this case, but sinkholes only happen in a certain part of Minnesota. And the part that Brennan went missing doesn't get sinkholes. Sinkholes need certain like conditions for them to develop and those conditions aren't present in that part of Minnesota. So Bella did say that sinkholes are common in the area, but I just wanted to point out that sinkholes only happen in the southwesterly part of Minnesota and not actually anywhere near the part that um, he went missing. Um, they, uh, they require certain conditions to develop and it is very unlikely um, that he fell into a sinkhole because they don't happen in that area. But she did say she didn't think that he had fallen in one. I just thought I would clear that up. The next theory is that he went missing on purpose and uh, that's such a silly one because first of all, like who's, like no, I'm, I'm not even gonna go into this one. Like he didn't go missing on purpose. He was asking for help. He was on the phone to his dad. He didn't go missing on purpose. I'm not even gonna go into that theory. The next theory branches off into two theories. And this brings in a piece of um, information that is alleged. Uh, allegedly, the dogs picked up his scent on a piece of farming machinery in the area. Pair this with the fact that there are a lot of farmers, and in particular one farm, who have refused giving searchers access to their property. And this could be for a myriad of reasons. Uh, this is America. <laughs> this this is uh, an area, or, or at least a group of people, a culture of people, who are extremely ingrained in their rights. Um, and I put rights in quotes because rights are different everywhere, right? So their right to their privacy, their right to bear arms, their right to property, all that kind of stuff. Americans um, have 
constitutional rights, which Australians don't see, uh, like, like if the police want to search an Australian's house, we generally don't feel like we have the right to say no, or that we have the option to say no. Uh, whereas Americans will be like, not till you have a warrant, um, or like, you're not searching my property, and it's like, well shit, like if there's not, you know, evidence, then they can't search their property. So it might not be that the, the farmer who says, no, you cannot search on my property, it might not be that that farmer is a killer, or they've abducted Brendan. Um, it might just be because Americans push back on authority quite often when it comes to their rights. The second reason that a farmer might not want uh, police or searches on their property is because it's, it's quite possible that they're also conducting some sort of uh, unrelated illegal things on their farmland. Whether or not it's just some, you know, growing some marijuana for personal use or maybe they've got undocumented workers or even undocumented machinery as I've seen um, someone else mention, but it could literally be just something that is completely unrelated. So that might also be another reason as to why the farmer has refused. Another reason is like, we don't know if this is just like one person who owns this farm. It could be a corporation who owns this farm. Um, and then you would, you, you would need the permission of a corporation to then search the farm. We know with the Brian Schaefer case that uh, the corporation who was in charge of the construction refused to dig up any more holes or um, bring up any concrete even though there was somebody who was missing and most likely something had happened in that construction site but if there's not enough evidence a corporation is not going to spend that money or waste their time just on a missing person and that's that's super shitty but it happens all the time and time is money and money is money now the next part of the theory that it branches off to is the fact that it might have been an accident. And even though this is a branching off of a theory, this also branches off into other theories and branches off into what I believe. We know that he had fallen into the Yellow Medicine River. We know that he was dressed extremely lightly and we know that he had lost access to a working phone. We know that he may have lost his glasses in the river. We know that he was legally blind. We also know that he hadn't eaten in a fair few hours. We can also attest to the fact that he had been drinking and was likely fatigued from walking so long and so far. With all of this considered, this is a cocktail of hypothermia and this is what I believe. It was three degrees that night. And the fact of, of all of those things put together, I genuinely believe that he either fell asleep somewhere because he was so fatigued and it was so cold and maybe he gave up. Maybe he didn't give up, you know, intentionally, permanently, like I'm giving up my life, whatever. Maybe he gave up on walking for that night. You know what? He, my phone's not working, it's freezing cold, I've been walking for so long, um, I can't see, um, I'm just gonna lay down, go to sleep, figure it out in the morning. And then maybe he died of hypothermia, hopefully in his sleep. Or maybe, and like you don't want this to be the thing, but it is the most likely thing that he didn't fall asleep and then die peacefully in his sleep. He likely died of hypothermia, he likely, uh, suc succumb to the elements, which is what a lot of people have said. That is the most likely thing. But then that branches off into his scent being picked up on machinery, farmer machine, farming machinery. So it's possible that he died in the fields. Why do we not have a body all these years later? Like it's past a decade old. People are still searching. Why do we not have any trace of his body, his possessions, any form of DNA. That could be for a couple of different reasons, but a really, really strong theory here uh, that a lot of people believe is that maybe on uh, a piece of farming machinery, he was, like his body was run over. Um, he may have already been dead by that point because the most likely 
um, you know, end to this case is that he died of hypothermia. Even if he died of hypothermia, the thing that we still want to know is where is the body? And so now people are saying that, well, maybe he got run over by a piece of farming machinery, or maybe he got squished by machinery or mulched. I take issue with this. I take issue with this theory because there are, I'm sure, I am sure that the dogs would have found DNA. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there was that farmer who didn't let them on their property. Um, I guess, I guess I can't say that, I guess I can't rule that out because uh, there is still one farm that hasn't been searched and that the dogs tried to go to, but hasn't been searched. So, I mean, I guess I can't, I guess I can't say, oh, well, they would have found DNA because maybe they can still find DNA on that farm, but uh, I won't know until that, that farmer or the, the corporation that possibly owns that farm gives permission for it to be searched, which I don't think is ever going to happen, especially after all these years. But that is what people believe that he died of hypothermia. And then the reason that we can't find his body is because it was either hidden by someone knowingly on that farm or run over by someone accidentally on that farm. And I'm going to assume that if anything like that happened, it was definitely an accident because we know that he most likely died of hypothermia. No one's going to see a dead person that they didn't kill, that they have no responsibility for and be like, now I must hide it. They would call the police. I'm not going to rule that out. That is a very strong theory. It's just not what I believe. I actually believe that he died of hypothermia, but I believe that he died past that gravel road where the dogs lost his scent. I think they lost his scent, obviously, because the road was redone that morning. I think he died past that road. I want to not believe that he was run over on that farm. I want to not believe that that farm holds the key to it. I want to believe that he found somewhere nice to die past that gravel road, and that's why we haven't found him. I think it's a really unfortunate thing that the morning of the search just so happened to be the morning that they redid that road. I don't, like a lot of people are like, the reason they redid the road is because someone killed him. I don't think so. I think it's just an unfortunate coincidence um, that they redid the road and that's where the scent was lost. I don't think that anyone, you know, because you need counsel permission to do that usually um, and that usually happens in advance so I don't think that anyone planned to redo the road so that they would lose a scent I just think that it's an unfortunate coincidence that that had happened that morning the only other thing that I've seen people bring up a lot is that he fell into a well um, there's a really really great website which basically like an investigation report and it rules out a lot of theories like if i didn't debunk these theories enough for you i'll link this below um but it, it debunks it like it debunks like almost every theory but a lot of people have said that he fell into a well the investigation report says that it's extremely unlikely first of all because um all modern wells from like a hundred years ago are only big enough for a puppy to fall down but not a whole human person and then any wells that were prior to 100 years old were ordered to be filled in um like with cement and stuff like that so i don't think he fell into a well that is the case of brendan swanson you already know my theory. I think you guys already know that with these cases, I believe the science and the logic behind them. Um, I do love a good conspiracy theory and that is where science and logic can't explain it. But I, yeah, I believe the route that the sniffer dogs took, it lines up pretty well with uh, what Brian said that Brendan had said on the phone. And uh, yeah, I believe that with the conditions of his personal circumstance, you know, like alcohol and fatigue and all that kind of stuff, uh, on top of the fact that he had just fallen in the Yellow Medicine River, was drenched in cold water, which would have been freezing, by the way. I didn't even think about that. If it's three degrees, the water would have been even more cold, and then the wind, and yeah, it just makes sense that he died of hypothermia. I just wonder where he died. 
that's my question and that's something that I have no idea about. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up because it really does help. Um, and if you like True Crime Sundays, I do them every single Sunday. So you're in luck. So um, you know how to subscribe. Uh, join my little True Crime family. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you later. I'll see you next Sunday. Or no, I'll see you on Wednesday if you like my Wednesday videos. But I'll likely see you next Sunday. Hey you guys, so I just wanted to interject here, or at least add on, um, the fact that Brandon Swanson's case is actually, um, featured on Vicat, which is like a, the FBI's list for violent and sexual crimes. So, read into that what you will or want to, um, but generally people don't get put on there unless it has something to do with foul play. Um, but I, it might be on there because they really want to get it solved and they want to give it as much, I don't know, you just keep that in mind.